This episode was sponsored by Fair Anita. Fair Anita offers fair trade products ethically sourced from 8,000 plus women in nine countries across the world. Their jewelry, clothing, bags, and more are always created in ethical working conditions. They're on a mission to create a world where women feel safe, valued, and respected, no matter their geography. Fair Anita. Cute. Ethical. Affordable. This episode is also made possible by our Patreon supporters, Eric and Carolyn Shumway, Eugene Lewis, Jamie Lang, Jill Harrigan, Maria Carlos Sanchez, Heather McKinnon, Valerie Jacobson, Chantel Oliver, Bryony e. Lines, Tamzane Weir, Caitlin McTaggart, Lindsay Cummings, Rachel Kay, Jessica Smith, Kim Hokinson, Tracy Steeb, Bo Yeager, and Janelise Cannon. And a very happy birthday to Stephanie Williams. Hey Katie, you know what somebody should do? What? Somebody should write a history of the world in sisters. Yeah. Like a, a <laughs> history of the whole world told through the stories of sisters. Wow. Yeah, what a lens to look at the history of the world through. Yeah. That's brilliant. Hold on a second. Wait. Didn't we do that? Oh, wait. Yes, we did. <laughs> it's called The Book of Sisters, illustrated by a team of 35 international illustrators. Get your copy anywhere books are sold or on our website, whatshernamepodcast.com. Just click on shop. Katie. Hi, Olivia. I hope you're excited because we are going on a field trip. Yay! I don't care where we're going. <laughs> I think you're going to like where we're going. Okay. But maybe not as much as me. Interesting. That's a hint. <laughs> I want you to imagine you are walking into a 16th century building site. Okay. You're in London. Uh-huh. And this particular building site is a huge church. Okay. So things are quite grand. All around you, frenetic activity, bustle, noise, animals working, pulling loads. Big wooden cranes and other construction devices. Stonemasons, carpenters, and in every grand historical drama or meticulously recreated documentary I've ever seen, these people all had one thing in common. They were all men. Oh, well, of course. I mean, women are not going to be found employed as stonemasons or carpenters, etc. Right. on the most important large-scale building projects in European religious history. Mm-hmm. Or are they? <laughs> I'm Olivia Mickle. And I'm Katie Nelson. And this is What's Her Name? Fascinating Women You've Never Heard Of. We are on the site of Westminster Abbey. Oh, hey! Possibly my favorite church in the entire world. As you and everyone who came on our Lost Women of England tour last year with us experienced uh -huh. <laughs> being there with me. <laughs> oh man, a full four hours, more than four hour tour of Westminster Abbey. There has been a church here since the seventh century, mm -hmm. or so the story goes. But we're here in the year 1698. Construction on this building that we are standing in began under Henry III in the mid-13th century. But the stonework is crumbling, the roof is starting to give way. And since Sir Christopher Wren has already been tasked with rebuilding about half of London because of a minor difficulty that happened a few years ago, <laughs> namely uh, the, the Great, Great Fire. Fire. <laughs> uh huh. Why not add another spot to his list? We're creating a brand new city. Gotta make Westminster match. Mm hmm And our guide on this time travel jaunt is Erin Patterson. Hooray! Hello. 
I'm Aaron and I am a Community Learning Officer at Westminster Abbey. I've been here for five years and in those years I've just been exploring lots of different stories that we can uncover that are new things that we might want to tell people who are visiting the Abbey and give them a different insight from the usual story of royals and coronations. You know, we all want to hear those stories, but there are other stories between three and a half thousand people who are buried and remembered here. There's definitely going to be something for everyone. Erin Patterson is Westminster Abbey's community learning officer in charge of all their programs for children and families. Awesome. And just the most delightful human being you will ever meet in your life. And the best special access tour guide. Absolutely. <laughs> and on that tour, if you remember, he introduced us to a little mystery in the Abbey. I was so fascinated by this that I went back later that afternoon, four hours in Westminster Abbey, not nearly enough for uh -huh. me, <laughs> and I went back later that afternoon to find out more about this. And I did not freak out at all being in the amazing medieval space in the top of the Abbey looking out over the gallery. I'm I was sure totally you didn't. Calm. Mm -hmm. with the incredible Abbey organist rehearsing for Evensong in the background. Uh -huh. So while I might normally apologize for any sound issues for a on-site interview, in this situation, I'm going to say you're welcome. How fun. Yep. So in the Abbey, my office is about three stories up in a Victorian building. And on the level below me is the Clerk of the Works. And the Clerk of the Works is a job title I had never heard of before I started working at the Abbey. And it's essentially uh, the person who has overall responsibility for the day-to-day -day sort of fabric of the building. So they're in charge of carpenters, plumbers, electricians, all of these people who are um, looking after the building. Above them is a job called the Surveyor of the Fabric, which is actually a, almost a completely different job now. They are going to be like an architect who sort of looks at the function of the building. So the Abbey is a huge building. We've got stonemasons, carpenters, plumbers, all sorts of tradespeople to sort of look after this incredible building. And we've always had those people. So the role of the Clerk of the Works has existed for many, many years. We all know about Sir Christopher Wren, who rebuilt St Paul's Cathedral after the Great Fire of London. But not a lot of people actually know that he was also the surveyor of the fabric at Westminster Abbey. Now I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that despite Aaron Patterson's faith in our listeners' knowledge, I am guessing that a few of our listeners may not all know Sir Christopher Wren. <laughs> So, tiny little tutorial here. So when the Great Fire of London burned down everything in 1666, obviously huge rebuilding project. Sir Christopher Wren, one of the premier architects in London at the time, is tasked with rebuilding originally 55 churches, I think it is, and put in charge of huge swaths of the architecture of what we now know as London. <laughs> Iconic London. What is London? His greatest achievement, famously St. Paul's Cathedral, but he was actually also put in charge of Westminster Abbey. And his vision for Westminster was a little bit different from what we see now. Now, just in case there is a handful of weirdos who didn't spend most of the summer of their 13th year obsessively studying everything they could find about Westminster Abbey. <laughs> These two square towers on the west front of Westminster are iconic. They are Westminster. Mm -hmm. They're the image on all the merch. They're extremely famous. And they were not Wren's plan at all. <laughs> He had all of these grand plans to put pillars and uh, spires around the abbey. Where we've got the two towers at the west front now, he wanted to have two sort of rounded rotunda um, structures. But one of the designs was this spire that he wanted to have right in the middle of the lantern, which is right in the centre of the crossing. As you probably know, the abbey is shaped like a cross. And he was appointing head labourers and tradespeople to do this work. He was outsourcing it. 
and uh, one of the people that he was outsourcing it to was the head carpenter and the head carpenter in the 1700s was a woman called Elizabeth Gregory. Hold on. What? A woman? Head carpenter. Well. Now I'm going to admit right up front, we know almost nothing about Elizabeth Gregory. (laughs) I have spent 10 months trying to track down anything else (laughs) about her. Here's what I have found. She was born Elizabeth Gray in 1666. Whoa. Yes, the year of the fire. Wow. It's a good year to be a carpenter. In 1687, she married John Gregory, who was a carpenter. Oh, my. 1688 is the Glorious Revolution. I mean, she's living through some huge stuff in London. Yeah, and the, and in Westminster, right? Yeah. Westminster goes from the royal church to being lightly vandalized but repurposed. Mm-hmm. And then Cromwell ends up buried there, and then they dig him up. I mean... Yeah, wow. This is the center Puritanism, of... Puritanism, and then not, and yeah. then... The restoration of the monarchy. And she's there in the middle of all of it. Wow. And then after John Gregory died, she was hired as head Abbey Carpenter and continued in that role until her death in 1719. Wow. And that's what we know. (laughs) Okay. Well, and after many hours and lots of help, trolling the National Archives, we have maybe possibly located her will. Maybe. Whoa, There's a lot of Elizabeth huge. Gregory's. <laughs> she is a mystery. But what a mystery. We don't really know a great deal about Elizabeth Gregory, but we have a beautiful model that she has made of Christopher Wren's design for this spire and it takes us from the base of the abbey all the way up to this sort of point that would have looked out across London across the Houses of Parliament almost sort of competing with Big Ben. Ah the scale model yes that that we we saw saw. up in the it's amazing it's like a little diorama but the most sophisticated (laughs) The most amazingly sophisticated <laughs> yeah. dollhouse. <laughs> mm-hmm. And it's not little, it's five feet tall. Yeah, I really like how in the early modern era, carpenters and designers would make those like massive models and it would be the thing that everybody works from. Yeah. And they put so much time and resources into the model. Before they even build the church. Yeah, you know, we we now look at what sometimes churches will make these now as a sort of way of here's how to get a grasp of the hugeness of this building. You know, you can see the whole thing. Yeah. But these were functional documents. And as Aaron Patterson points out, these were the best and only way to explain to the people you're asking for money what you want to do. So now we see these like awful artist sketches of new builds, don't we, that (laughs) are getting built and there's like animated figures in them. (laughs) And so in the 1700s, they're commissioning full-blown oil paintings of what this is going to look like with figures in it sort of showing scale, etc. Now, I'm sure a lot of people noticed that sentence after her husband died, Elizabeth Gregory was hired. Yeah. Classic. Classic and fraught. There is sort of traditionally looking back in the past, this idea that women would take on the role that their husband had if their husband died. That sort of a tradition is in many things, like often with politicians, a politician dies and the woman just takes the role until such time that they can be replaced. But Elizabeth Gregory held the role of head carpenter for quite some time and we know that she was appointed by Sir Christopher Wren so he chose her to do this work. I don't think she was sort of a a sympathy vote or 
just sort of the next person in line to do it. There was lots of other carpenters around. And she, we know that she was also subcontracting work to other carpenters who would have been available to take that position. There's also sometimes a belief that the widow would take on the role and hold the position for her son to then take on the role mm. when he came of age. But with Elizabeth Gregory, we know from the documents in our files, from payrolls and accounts, that she was hired and her son were hired at the same time. Mm. So they were working together. In fact, she might even have been subcontracting to him. We don't know. It is a fact. This is the way that a lot of women were first able to step into realms where they were not allowed as widows. We know that she wasn't a placeholder because she held the job for 15 years. <laughs> and when it's Sir Christopher Wren, most famous architect in British history, and he can literally hire anyone he wants, and this is the most important church in London, yeah. he's not picking a placeholder to do that job. She must be exceptional. Well, legally in London in the 1600s, I mean, that's that's legally the only way that women could have a role mm. like that. It, so it'd be illegal. Oh, yeah. I hadn't even thought about that. You literally right. cannot have Only a widows can play any role in a guild system. Only if the guild accepts them. And the guild controls everything. So in my mind, anytime you come across a widow who steps into the role of her husband. In my mind, I think of her as a Mary Irwin type, the rope maker. Oh, of course. Like, while the man officially had the title, the woman was actually doing it all. And the guild knows it, so when the husband dies, they're like, yeah, it was you all along, so carry on. Any woman who is allowed in earned her way there. So it's a really interesting sort of landscape where these people aren't directly employed by the Abbey necessarily. It's all a bit sort of an individual capitalist sort of <laughs> working environment. Elizabeth Gregory is the head carpenter. All of the other carpenters are freelancers. And she is the boss of all of these independent contractors. Mm hmm so she is running a massive, massive business enterprise. And she must be extraordinarily successful. She's obviously extremely confident in her own importance and the value of her time. So one of the things we know is that if she had to be called into the Abbey for a meeting, that her time was precious and she was going to charge for it. <laughs> so. She would, we've got documents of her charging extra to attend the Abbey for meetings. And that, I just love that detail so much. So I love that she was um, really in control of her business. She charges them extra to meet wow. with Sir Christopher Wren and talk about the project. Wow. She's a boss. Wow, how fascinating. The other remarkable thing here is contrary to the picture we built up at the beginning of this episode, Elizabeth Gregory is not the only woman doing this. There are other women employed here. As carpenters? As all kinds of things. <laughs> there was also a lady called Sarah Spur who was a smith. And again, a widow, but taking on work and being contracted to do that work in the Abbey. A smith! Oh, that's great! The idea of women as influential, skilled construction labor, 16th, 17th, 13th century, wow, is so wild. But it was not wild then. Apparently, it was normal enough that Christopher Wren is hiring a woman as wow. the head carpenter for Westminster Abbey. And this lack of records is, of course, the classic women's history problem. Nobody wrote down women's lives. They weren't important enough. So much of that story that we have of what women were allowed to do, what women were doing at any given time, is based in just a total lack of information 
Mm -hmm. And that leads us to these wrong conclusions. Because we don't have any information about what women were doing, we assumed they weren't building cathedrals. And they were. See, we just need a time machine. <laughs> what if women were always doing stuff? <gasps> what? <laughs> Let's pause for just a second to thank our sponsor, Fair Anita. They're on a mission to create a world where women feel safe, valued, and respected, no matter their geography. Fair Anita offers fair trade products ethically sourced from 8,000 plus women in nine countries across the world. Fair Anita's bags, jewelry, gifts, scarves, clothes, and more are all made in ethical working conditions. Almost all their products are made from recycled materials, carbon footprint offset, locally sourced, and Beautiful! I am literally wearing my scarf right now. Hand-woven, hand-dyed in Vietnam. Wow. I cannot believe it. It's gorgeous. Thank you. And I know you love a scarf, but that is a beautiful scarf. I don't think I'm going to take it off. These are actual ethical fair trade goods. And almost all of their products are under $20. And they're gorgeous. Use the code HERNAME, all one word and all caps, and you'll get 10% off any order. Farinita.com. Cute, ethical, affordable. So, Head Carpenter of Westminster Abbey is the massive business enterprise. You are managing hundreds of independent workers who are presumably doing a lot of that work off-site and then bringing it in. And it's not just the things that we see in the Abbey now. It's not just the decorative woodwork. It's not just the pieces that are left. It's all of the woodwork that makes the rest of it possible. Oh, yeah. It is all of the scaffolding that you need to put up stonework. It is the entire wood frame that you build to put a roof on. All of that work is mm. under It's a her. lot of math and engineering yes. and designing basically like machinery that can heft Massive. heavy loads and building pulley systems that you can hook up to oxen. It's sourcing the wood from a increasingly limited... <laughs> Re resource in Britain. Funny you should mention that is one of the very few pieces of evidence we have for Elizabeth Gregory's existence oh. is a bill that she submitted to the surveyor of the fabric. We also know that she would supply materials so there's a, an order that she has to provide of 10 tree trunks that she has to supply and it charges like £10 and that includes the carriage and everything so it's like if she's able to get hold of that, is she doing that elsewhere? It's just so interesting to think, like, what was her working life? Uh -huh. Especially if she's like, okay, well, you want me to come in, that's more. And what else was she making? Where else was she working? Uh -huh. If she's like a subcontractor or a contractor to the Abbey, has she got contracts elsewhere? Wow. And I just love thinking about her here in this space, doing mm -hmm. this work. You know, the Abbey was built as a monastery for monks. We had 40 men who mm. lived and worked here, prayed here, sang here. So what, how had that moved on? You know, the clergy were definitely going to all still be men in 1710. What was it like for a woman to be in this space and to be working in this space, not here as a worshipper, but as a, a professional equal in this, you know, really male dominated building? She is bossing around wow. manly carpentry men. Sure. In she's, this completely male space. She's certainly got the keys to everything. And that's cool to imagine. Imagine her walking through the nave of Westminster, <sighs> looking around. And Aaron Patterson raised what is obviously the most important question here. Mm. And what was she wearing? <laughs> what is she wearing? Okay. She's climbing around. 
Mm. Presumably, she has to. And even if she's not doing the work, she's yeah. inspecting the work. She has to be mobile. Because if you're doing this manual labor, you don't want to be in layers and layers of velvets and. <laughs> Is she wearing trousers? Ooh. Is she climbing scaffolding in a skirt? None of these seem like they would be acceptable. Mm. Did she predate bloomers by 150 <laughs> years? I need to know, and yeah. we'll never know. I must say I have recently learned a lot more than I ever thought I would know about building sites all the way from <laughs> medieval to Victorian times and beyond. And I think really focusing in on this process of building has made me appreciate, again, just what an absolutely staggering mm. accomplishment this is. I mean, I, I knew that and I've read these books and I've thought about it a lot. But the fact that we're creating all of this with workers who can't read, when the Abbey is first built, they're doing this work without blueprints, yeah. without instructions, with maybe a wooden model or somebody's mm -hmm. idea loosely described. Yeah, I remember as we were walking through Westminster Abbey, just looking at one of the fluted columns mm. and noticing the seams in the stone, you know, that it it's, it is a fluted column. It right. looks completely cohesive, but it's separate stones that have all been carved off-site individually by different people. Yeah, and you have 20 different pieces yeah. made by 20 different people in 20 <laughs> different places, and they all magically together. all match yeah. perfectly. I, the, it's mind-boggling. I bet she thought about that, too. I mean, there she is working on it in the late 1600s, and that has been the church yeah. <laughs> for centuries by the time she's working on it. I'm sure the weight of it, the significance of what she was doing as the next in line in this huge ongoing creation, I'm sure that was not lost on her. I wonder if she yeah. ever just walked through the building and pondered all the people who've come before and everybody who has left their mark on it. Yeah, I mean, the... The people doing this work are the people in the best position to really ha understand that experience, to walk around and mm. say, look at the lives yeah. that have gone into this building. For me, it's hard to imagine the time scale of that, right? Nothing that we do in the world right now takes as long. <laughs> the idea of spending weeks mm -hmm. on a tiny piece of a tiny piece of a building yeah in our individualistic modern society i don't think that's really a thing anymore yeah at least <laughs> not in the western hemisphere but maybe we are maybe that's just different maybe we don't do it with buildings anymore but we do it with i don't know like online gaming universes or Okay, people yeah. Will. No, that's really... There's millions of hours going into people building public Minecraft servers. Yeah. And, yeah, I mean, the amount of hours that go into just a video game. Yeah. By 200 people whose name will be in font size yeah. 4. Interesting. The amount of human hours that go into making a blockbuster movie. Well, that one I think about a lot movies with 900 people who all have to be good at their jobs. <laughs> <laughs> so I take it back. People are still dumping lifetimes into things bigger than themselves, but it's just not They're just not stone physical objects buildings. as much anymore. Yeah. yeah. Huh. Huh. Go humans. So I want to come back to Elizabeth Gregory's model of an alternate Westminster Abbey for a minute. Because this really is the main piece of evidence we have from Elizabeth Gregory's life. And it's the reason that we specifically know about her at all, because Aaron got interested in her and then told us about her. 
and because it's just an incredible object worthy of discussion all on its own. This would have been the center of London. It would have been the iconic image of the skyline. This massive spire, as tall as the shard. For me, I get a real sort of weird sense of scale yeah. of like wow. the height of the building feels right. And then the spire is enormous. Yeah. It's the height of the building again and a half. So it really would have been competing with Big Ben. It would have been a really, really attractive thing. I can sort of see why Sir Christopher Wren would want it. And when you look at this model, like look, walking around it, you can sort of get a real sense of grandeur from it. And as a national church, perhaps it, it would have been a fantastic symbol, but maybe it would have been too much. I mean, I'm, I'm a fan of too much. So. <laughs> no I, I love camp and much. as church design goes, I would say this is quite camp. But. <laughs> <laughs> and as a royal symbol, that maybe really works, especially as you pointed out now in the restoration, right? We have. Mm -hmm lost our monarchy and brought it back, making the royal church the visual center of the city. Yeah. It's a pretty powerful political Sure, make it the tallest too. thing. Yeah, this is the thing that you see in London. We have to assume that it was designed by Elizabeth Gregory. It's credited in her name, and presumably she designed it with Sir Christopher Wren, who designs the design, but she's the one creating the design for this model. The model itself was made by three male carpenters, and it took the three of them working together 185 days. Well, for a model. So again, this time scale, uh, right? That, that mm -hmm. three skilled artisans <laughs> spent half a year oh, wow. building making a, model. a model of a building and she is overseeing it she's like again it's a mystery Carry on, boys. we don't have enough records to know exactly what the process is but it, it's hmm. her name mm -hmm. so she must have been heavily involved yeah. presumably designing or helping Christopher Wren take his design into Interesting. 3D wood. And it's it, it's a good example of the really frustrating task of trying to put together these women's lives from about four documents mm -hmm. <laughs> that exist in the world. And it's so, it's weirdly new looking too. I mean, I yeah, remember talking about definitely. this with you at the time. Uh -huh. If you told me it was made 10 years ago, uh -huh. I would believe you. It, it's, it looks... it's not just perfectly preserved. Yeah. And it feels modern uh -huh. somehow. Something about it feels extremely contemporary and, and innovative now. And it's, it's almost impossible to explain what I mean by that. <laughs> but it doesn't look like... Yeah. An 18th century Yeah, when I model. first saw it, I remember thinking, oh, the museum staff have made a yes. model of what the church was supposed to look like back yeah. then or something like that. Like this is exactly. a, a piece that the museum has made to help us understand. Yeah. I never, ever would have thought that it was historical. That it's 300 years old. <laughs> It's not just a model. When you kneel down or you crouch down and get on person level, it it somehow magically truly works as a 3D tour. You feel like you are walking mm. into the space. I still don't understand mm -hmm. how it's possible. It feels like you are inside the model. It's hard for me to imagine a London where this Westminster mm. exists because it is so shockingly different well, from what why we have. Why wasn't it? Aaron Patterson reckons it was maybe just too expensive. Because mm. the Abbey, we're a royal peculiar. So we sit outside of the Church of England. Mm. Um, and that means we don't get funded by mm. the Church of England. And although we're, the Queen is sort of, we call her the visitor here. She's her Majesty is the 
I would always say the boss of the, the boss, church, but yeah. actually we're not owned by the royal family, we're not a, a royal palace or anything like that, so we don't actually get any funding from the crown, the government or the church, so we've always been self-funded and by donations, by selling memorial space in the abbey. Mm. So I can only imagine that this was just considered too expensive. But interestingly, it's only 30 years after this that those West Towers go up. And that was the next um, surveyor of the fabric, Nicholas Hawksmoor, mm. who put those up. And so it must have been quite a quick turnaround, actually, from her finishing this. She dies just a couple of years later. Mm. And then suddenly the plans for something else come into play and then we've, we've got this iconic front there now wow. that I think is what people think of when they think of the Abbey. So it's entirely possible that this design didn't land. Mm-hmm. Nobody liked it enough to give Christopher Wren the money for it and they scrapped it and went with something else. Huh. Maybe this is the reject model that they put <laughs> in storage. They were like, forget it. And that's why it survives, because another yeah. model won out. No one is using it. Yeah. It's never used for construction, getting stuff dropped on Yeah, it. maybe it was just on the menu. It was, it was one of many options, and they mm. just rejected this one. She dies only a few years after this model is built. She doesn't get to work on the modern Hawksmoor iconic frontage. But although the model is the most obvious proof of life we have for her, really her most important real work is all around us in the Abbey. Everywhere you go, seen and marveled at by tourists and worshippers every day, is her work. And there's no way to know which parts are hers. Hmm. Just last week, I was up in the Abbey roof and we were looking at the timbers that hold the roof together. And I was just thinking about the skill of the carpenters who built the Abbey and who maintain the Abbey even today. And just the work that goes in to creating and keeping the building looking beautiful. She's everywhere and nowhere. After this interview, I was sort of wandering around just looking at things. Is this Elizabeth? Is that Elizabeth? Hmm. Where are you, Elizabeth? It was a very odd and surreal and sort of humbling feeling. And it really brought home to me something kind of ridiculous about the way that most of us visit places like this. There are 3,000 people buried at Westminster Abbey, hmm. which is already hard to comprehend. Yeah. We arrive, and we look at names on memorials, and we visit the really super famous people. You know, if you're a What's Your Name fan, you go and stare at Margaret Cavendish's amazing tomb and rejoice. <laughs> uh -huh. And you get angry that Caroline Herschel's not there with her brother. Mm -hmm. And you find the names you, you know on the wall. Poet's Corner. But the best of the best, the most talented of the talented, are in every inch of this building. They created mm. this building. They created the memorial that you're looking at because it has a famous person's name on it. Mm. And you have no idea who made it. It's such a shift in perspective for me now that I, I can never go and look at these spaces again without thinking, who made this? Who cut that stone? Who created the scaffolding that let them put that thing way up there at the top? Yeah. It feels like a symbol of so much that happens. These tiny hints of people's lives that you'll never get more than that. How many other women are hidden, mm -hmm. literally and figuratively, <laughs> behind these walls, under these floors? How many women were here and will never know their names? It's enough to prompt an existential crisis. <laughs> but I was just thinking how beautiful it is. That oh, it's a beautiful existential crisis. They left something behind. Something remains of their life centuries after. That is magnificent. 
And now, for something exciting. <laughs> 23 hours ago, this was going to be where we would talk about how sad it is that Elizabeth Gregory isn't buried in the Abbey. Mm. I was just going to ask if she was buried in the Abbey. And 23 hours ago, my answer was going to be, we don't know where she's buried. Okay. 24 hours ago, Aaron Patterson discovered Elizabeth Gregory is buried at Westminster Abbey. <gasps> no. He knows exactly where she is. <gasps> Her name has worn off. Oh, my. But she's there. And in fact, on our tour, we stood in front of her memorial. What? Unknowing. Because if you remember, there is famously one plumber from the Abbey who is buried in the Abbey. Mm hmm. And she is right next to him. What? We stood at her grave and didn't know it. How fantastic is that? It made me so happy. And it made Aaron Patterson so happy that he immediately went on a little pilgrimage for us. Ah. Uh. It's really exciting that we now actually know where Elizabeth Gregory is buried. She's buried in the cloisters of Westminster Abbey. And the cloisters are really interesting because they contain, I would say, like the family of the Abbey. It's people who've served the Abbey, who have had really strong connections with the fabric of the building, with the life of the building. So there's lots of choir members, lots of former canons. There's a plague pit, very close to where Elizabeth Gregory is buried. But she's also buried next to some really esteemed people. So just around the corner is Afra Ben a hugely famous, influential writer, and also a famous actress, Anne Bracegirdle. And I think Elizabeth Gregory would have known who both of those people are, so she's in a quite esteemed company. And she's also under a very modern memorial to Edmund Halley, the astronomer. But she's also next to one of my favourite burials in the cloisters, of Philip Clark, who's a plumber. He's got quite a simple grave, and it just says that he is the plumber to the collegiate church. And in a way, that's who Elizabeth Gregory is as well. She's part of the community, and it will be the community who've decided that she should be buried and remembered in the Abbey. And it's just a fascinating place that gets walked over all the time, every day, which is probably part of why her grave has been worn away and her name isn't there any longer, which is really, really tragic. But I know now where she is and I'll be able to think of her every time I pass there. And to know now where she's buried, I feel it just brings the whole story full circle. And even if our thousands of visitors walk over her grave every day without knowing, I know, and I can tell other people, because of this podcast, because of the research we've done, and I can tell the story more and more. Huge thanks to Aaron Patterson and everyone at Westminster Abbey for their help on this episode. If you'd like to hear more tidbits from our England tour, we did a whole bonus episode with behind the scenes peeks into that tour, and I'll link to that in the show notes. If you enjoyed this episode, you can find photos, resources, links, and more on our website at whatshernamepodcast.com. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, where we post lots of photos each week. Music for this episode was provided by Solus Choir of the Sun, Kira Zeman Rugen, and the Archive of Recorded Church Music. Our interns are Katie Boucher and Livia Foley. Our theme song was composed and performed by Daniel Foster Smith. What's Her Name is produced by Olivia Mickle and Katie Nelson, and this episode was edited by Olivia Mickle. <laughs> <laughs>